So now we're kind of go on to one of my favorite place, places to block people, and that is the neck. I absolutely loved in the different neck blocks, and they are very fun. And, you know, in general, I would, just while we're talking about necks, you know, these are, you know, the neck has a lot of real estate in it, right? And so it has some higher stake real estate. So when you're doing these with, you know, residents or med students or whoever, you want to try to keep in mind that, you know, when I do these with my residents at this point, I say, you do not advance the needle if you do not see the tip, um, because that is, that's going to prevent outcomes that you don't want to happen. So because of how high stake real estate is, you really want to only advance the needle if you can perfectly visualize the needle tip to make sure that you're going to poke something you don't want to poke. So, you know, how many times have you had someone that is just, you know, super agitated and you put a central line in, um, or they're just not going to be able to tolerate the pain of a central line. And uh, that is where the cervical plexus blocks come in. These are super fun blocks with really great results. So we kind of go through cervical plexus blocks. Some ER indications here. If you have any kind of like some mandibular or neck abscess, you can do these blocks for pain control is, uh, and for kind of, you know, for pain periprocedural. Um, for clavicle fractures, particularly mid-shaft clavicle fractures, this is a great block for pain control. Um, and then kind of one thing that we're actively studying right now um, is doing it for central lines. And another thing too, you know, we're, we're coming up towards July and you have some interns doing some central lines that <laughs> they can take a wee bit and they can be doing a bit of the digging around the neck. And it is, you know, a service to these patients to give, to make sure their entire neck is anesthetized during that, you know, hour long ordeal. So just something else good to keep in mind as you're kind of moving towards July here. So this is the area of anesthesia from a cervical plexus block and kind of going through the indications again, you're catching a little bit of the earlobe and kind of having a pretty big area. And, you know, if you, if you, this gets done right, it is pretty dense anesthesia. So it's pretty wild. You know, where's, where's the research on this larger case reports in terms of the EM realm? We're trying to study that right now. Um, and kind of one kind of thing in terms of kind of reviewing the anatomy. So this entire plexus kind of comes off the, you know, the spine and then, Initially, the kind of the the nerves that kind of trek just deep to the sternocleidomastoid, and then at about that C6 level, they kind of come out from underneath that sternocleidomastoid muscle and kind of spread to kind of innervate the entire neck. So those are kind of the areas that we'll consider hitting it is kind of where the traverse is deep to the sternocleidomastoid or further distal when they kind of branch out and kind of hit that whole area. And this is kind of just showing uh, on a cadaveric image where that would be. So it's kind of that about that C6 level, you kind of see them branch out there. Uh, this is uh, sonographically what you see here. So this is medial, this is lateral. You have sternocleidomastoid, that nice triangular muscle kind of working laterally. And the nerves, and, and someone's super skinny, you can sometimes see those little nerves, but it kind of runs literally just deep to that sternocleidomastoid. And then you're also kind of really important relative anatomy are these, st these scaling muscles down here. So you're kind of seeing a little bit of inner scaling brachial plexus right there. But this is a, a very important piece to this is identifying the scalings. So this is kind of just showing your anatomy where you would go. So it's kind of, this is kind of, you know, sliding kind of that posterior lateral side to that target area away from those great vessels. And uh, we're kind of just showing here kind of that implant approach coming posterior to anterior and aiming to dump that right beneath that sternocleidomastoid again here and just kind of showing another shot here. This is an example of a cervical plexus block here. This is done by anesthesia. You can see tucking right beneath this area here and kind of having it spread along this fascial plane. You do have nerves right in this area, which are very small. So you, one really important thing with this block is you wanna make sure it's a very low pressure injection. So you wanna be really mindful of whoever's on the syringe that they're very cautious with that. And uh, one of our attendings here made this really good point and they're like, well, how do I not drop the diaphragm on this when that phrenic nerve is so close in those images? And when you kind of dive into the literature on this, the phrenic nerve is a very consistently deep to the prevertebral fascia. Where is the prevertebral fascia? The prevertebral fascia is the fascia that surrounds the scalene muscles. So as long as you don't violate the scalene muscles, you should be fine. So this is kind of showing here, it's kind of like, so there's a little bit of nomenclature issues, whether or not it's like a superficial or an immediate cervical plexus block. It, it doesn't really matter. Most people tend to do this intermediate level 
even though that, you know, it's usually called a superficial one. No one does these deep blocks anymore because they have a lot more complications given the location. So pretty much no one's doing those. Uh, and, you know, kind of just some references is, you know, I'm doing a lot of these at that intermediate level where at which level you are aiming for when they're still deep to the center clad mass. So you want to be a little bit higher. So you're looking for your thyroid notch and that's about C4. So you're going to come up to C4 versus, you know, kind of lower at C6. And, you know, how often would you actually drop that phrenic even in the setting of, you know, doing a deep uh, block and, and even if you did a deep block, only 61% of patients will actually get their phrenic taken out in these studies. And you know, it, it's been you know, it's been kind of played out even in the cadaveric studies that if you don't violate the preventive fascia, you really shouldn't hit that phrenic nerve. So that's kind of how you stay safe with these blocks. Uh, there have been like some random kind of documentations of complications of causing like a, a Horner syndrome because you're so close to that sympathetic chain, but it really shouldn't, didn't cause anything severe beyond that. And you know, in one study. You know, they kind of compared the the pain results uh, between the superficial and intermediate, and they found at that hour zero, it's very similar. But you know, kind of later on, the intermediate had improved effect. We're we'll go through some cases of this now. So we had someone snowboarding in Ohio, despite how weird that sounds for people that aren't in Ohio. So it's kind of sweeping from C6 to C4, and you can kind of see you get so you get that kind of sandwich here. So you have scalenes. You have certain clay massoid, and you're kind of aiming for that that meat section in between those buns there. That's your target there. And this is this is kind of working lateral to medial, and our goal is to get right underneath that certain clay massoid where it's where it kind of has a nice spread and kind of separates those tissues apart. So not quite seeing it in this image, you can kind of see it's kind of bunching or bubbling up, and that's not what you want. You're not in the fascia plane if you see that. So we readjust. And now you can kind of see, it looks like it's actually splitting those fascial planes. So we're gonna keep going. And you can kind of see how it's splitting these fascial planes. And this was a great block. So that's really what you're looking for. And you really wanna get on the, again, muscle is surrounded by fascia. You wanna get on the underside of that fascia of that cerniclide massoid. And this is your target right in there. This is kind of an example of a setup here. And so this first block, what do you think about this? Well, you can see we're not, on the underside of that muscle, that muscle fascia. So we're not on the underside of that certain clay mastoid. So this one, when it was initially done, it had zero anesthesia and zero pain relief. And we're gonna kind of watch, this is kind of round two on that same person. We're gonna pop through, kind of work our way through here. And then we're gonna start injecting here. And you can kind of see the see that splitting apart. Now you have a good block. Now you have some good anesthesia. So you want to make sure you're on the other side of that. But you also still want to be mindful that you're not violating the scalenes, which has that preventive fascia on top of that. So we're kind of just go through a, what would you do next in your in your mind here. So just kind of say in your mind, what would you do next here? Would you advance? Would you withdraw? Or would you dump your anesthetic? So what would you do in this image? Well, probably should just keep you advancing, right? What about what about here? Advance, withdraw, or inject. So we're gonna advance a little bit more. And you can see, is this, is this spreading tissues or is it just bunching and bubbling up? I'd say it's bunching and bubbling up, so you need to advance further until you get into that fascial plane. So advance further, what about now? Are you seeing it spread now? You are, so now you're going to dump the rest of your anesthetic because now you're at your target site. And you can see some nice injection there. And you can see some really good spread. This is a really good block. 